Welcome everyone once again to Grandmaster's Choice. I am uh, Women Grandmaster Talia Cervantes. And um, last week we kind of had the topic of committing to a move, right? And kind of deciding where we should go for a move, where it's the right moment, whether we should have a breakthrough in our position, is there a tactical idea, all of that stuff. Uh, we looked at an example in which it is good to go for for a sacrifice, and then we also looked at a position in which um, it looked very natural to go for a sacrifice, but it wasn't 100% sure. And then it kind of just shows the reality of chess, right? Like sometimes you know that you should go for a sacrifice, sometimes you just don't know. So it's a mixture of intuition and calculation. That's kind of the main point of everything that I want to um, to, to showcase. And today is kind of a continuation of that, right? I have three examples from three of my games. We're kind of going over them. And at the same time, uh, try to build up some understanding and intuition on when it's good to make a sacrifice and when not, right? So this first example that we have right here is actually from a game of mine from 2019. And I played it at the Folkswoods Open, um, really strong tournament here in the US. And my opponent and I, we arrived to, to this position from a clean scamby decline. And after a lot of complications in the center, we ended up having this open position. As you can probably see, the last move from my opponent here was bishop to d7. And there is a reason why there's a question mark in that move, right? So essentially, before we start answering questions um, or suggesting moves about the position, I want to bring some light into um, how we should evaluate the position before getting started. And in this position right here, I want to ask, what are some of the most uh, noticeable factors, right? Um, like, how are the kings uh, in terms of safety? Are the pieces well placed? Who has better placed pieces? Uh, what does the pawn structure tell you? Things like that, right? So what are some, some factors that we can notice uh, from this position? Are there any ideas or are we just like, oh, well, no, my position, so I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Someone says that they want to take with the bishop. Mm. And this makes a lot of sense, right? Like when you're looking for candidate moves, obviously you want to um, to look at checks, captures, and threats, right? In this particular position, I don't, there are no checks. Uh, but we really have to start thinking about captures, right? Um, as well as threats. So it is a kind of common sense to consider moves like pawn takes or bishop takes, things like that in terms of threats. You might consider rook e7, um, maybe knight e2. There are, there are a lot of moves to consider, maybe knight e4 as well. I'm not sure, right? So, yeah, like for example, so Mosa 92, if queen takes, bishop c4, right? This is a big problem. But it all kind of ties it back, um, as well as the idea of bishop g6, it all kind of ties it back to where I was trying to reference, of like, where's the key in the position, right? And clearly it has to do with the bad shape of the, of the black king, and how we need to find a way to get to it quickly, right? Before there is some sort of defense, before um, there is some sort of... Uh, you know, a uh, way for black to, to get some counter attack on the wave, right? Because they also have some ideas of knight g4, which, which we sh should not um, uh, forget about. So in this particular position, I was playing with the white pieces, as I was saying, and the whole point is like, whether do I take on g6, or whether do I do something else, right? And I was thinking very long, very hard in this position over the board. And eventually, um, eventually I realized that um, either it was this moment or no other, right? Sometimes when you are in a position, um, 
most of the times I would say like you feel it more over the board, but you can kind of tell when there's a critical moment, right? It's like that moment in which, in which you need to stop, think for, uh, for some time, maybe spend a little bit more time than usual, like 10 to 15 minutes, try to fully assess what's going on at the board and then make a decision, right? And depending on what you do, the, the position itself is going to completely shift, right? So you really have to make sure that what you do is right. So a lot of people are saying bishop g6 in this position, but I'm wondering, like, did you calculate anything beyond that? Like, what are some variations for you guys to be recommending bishop g6? Because at the same time, we really have to be looking for black's defenses as well, right? We can't just assume, oh, it's not my game, bishop takes g6, and then we'll figure out later what happens, right? Like, there's got to be some, some substance to, to this move, right? Obviously, you have to consider what happens if pawn takes, but there are some other moves that black can do because taking back is not forced, right? So what to do? So there's one comment which um, is right. So if we play bishop takes g6, Obviously, uh, there are different moves that black can make, but we're going to focus, first of all, what happens if pawn takes, right? And the idea is that after queen g6, king h8, unfortunately, we can't just uh, checkmate the king with the queen alone, but we can bring our rook into the game, right? It really helps the fact that in this position, after bishop d7, all of our pieces are already in the center or looking towards the... Towards the, the the king side, right? So after uh, bishop takes, takes, queen g6, king h8, rook e7, there's not really a way to, to counteract all of the threats, right? Because there's this going on. Uh, if this knight moves, then there's queen h7 as well. So there are just too many threats and it's impossible to take care of all of them, right? Like for example, rook g8, queen h6, and the position is winning. So, Right, so that's what happens if pawn decides to take. But there's another move, right, that we really have to consider, which is the move that happened in the game. And it's the reason why I was thinking for so long about bishop to g6. And again, I want to emphasize how it is important to always be looking for the resources that the opponent has to defend, right? We can't just uh, have tunnel vision into one variation when we do a sacrifice because maybe the opponent has some other resources that we did not take into account and then we give up some material for nothing, right? So um, right now I want to talk about knight to g4, which is actually the move that was played in the game and I know that there is a question mark here, but it is the move that posed the most challenge to me, right? Because it's not really a defense, it's more of a counter attack, right? Um, which is a lot more scary. <laughs> so knight g4, the idea is that in the future, after takes takes, uh, the knight on f6 is not gonna be hanging and it's harder to play rook e7 because there are more open files for the rook. And then at the same time, there's this threat of knight to f2, right? So did any of you consider this move knight g4, first of all? Because I feel like the answer is no but I need you guys to, to tell me. I did after Leech just drew the white arrow. <laughs> well, maybe I shouldn't have... Um, is there a way for me to delete those? I wonder. Ah, yes, show variation arrows. Very good. Okay, that's turned off now. You learn something new every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Joke's on you. Now I know your tricks. Um, <laughs> but see, I'm getting a lot of comments. I'm getting a lot of comments that no, they didn't consider knight to g4. But imagine this was your game. Imagine this was your game, and then you miss knight g4, and then you are like, oh, whoops, and you, you know, you just spend maybe like. 
10 minutes calculating bishop g6 and now you only thought about i mean now you have to deal with knight g4 right and then you have to spend a lot more time maybe bishop g6 doesn't work anymore and you missed that so um that's why it's important <laughs> That's why it's important to take uh, defensive resources into account, and that's why I also try to emphasize a little bit um, the need to to calculate calculate variations or calculate moves with threats, right? Not just forcing moves of captures and checks, but also threats. So, what should we do here after knight g4? Which again is what happened in my game, but I was ready for it, so. Hang on, why continue? You got yourself into this mess, now you need to get yourself out of it. There's one suggestion for h3, but I fear that h3 might be a little bit slow. Uh, I feel like h3 might be a little bit slow because let's see, I'm considering knight of two directly. There's also a threat that I forgot to, um, to mention, which could be quite deadly, not just knight of two. Knight of two looks good to me. Um, because if king h2, there might be queen to f4, and that looks pretty strong. Um, but at the same time, you also have to take into consideration something like takes, takes, knight e3, right? And then it's not so clear still very complex um, what's going on at the at the board because there is bishop takes h7 but then king king h8 and then um, then it's hard to say what's going on because for example let's say you want to play like queen g6 knight takes queen h6 to have some sort of discovery attack there is always queen g7 which is a very big problem right so Unfortunately, I don't think you're gonna see a checkmate here with the queen and the bishop. At least not in this way, like if the queen was in front of the bishop, then it's a whole different story. Uh, but h3 might be a bit slow. Again, like bishop g6 was a very dynamic move, right? So knight to g4 gets the position even more tense. So now we have to keep amping up the pressure until the opponent just breaks, right? Because um, we really need to have some some powerful move here. So h3 doesn't cut it just for now. There are also suggestions for uh, bishop takes h7, but my question is like, again, uh, did you calculate the full variation? Because after king to h8, like obviously I'm gonna go to h8 and not to g7 because there's queen g6. So after king to h8, what would you want to do? Uh, because, again, all of the threats are still at large, right? There is, um, there is the idea of rook takes in knight e3, there is knight f2. Uh, there are some ideas even of queen e5, which is a little bit funny because um, if rook takes, takes, right? Um, I lost to you in Chicago Open, I think. Uh, well, interesting. I played Chicago Open a few times. Sometimes it went really well, sometimes it went absolutely terrible. But, um, yeah. So it looks like no one is really suggesting moves after bishop 2h7 and king h8. I don't know if there is like another idea, but this is kind of what I meant. Like, you always have to look and move further, right? You can't just cut the variation. Um, while your opponent still has threats that you have not covered, right? Um, so in this position right here, I think knight to d1 was another uh, suggestion, um, another move recommended. Knight to e1, knight to e1, I did not consider this move. Uh, let's see, what could possibly be wrong with it? Maybe there's nothing wrong with it. Maybe. Okay, so I guess... Uh, okay, I, I guess there is this, right? Something like takes, takes. 
well, you don't even have to play King H8, you can play Queen G7, right? And then all of a sudden, because the knight is not on F6, our queen can go back, right? And then this becomes a, a big issue as well in the attack. So like I said, here we kind of have to play with some, with some more action. Another move that was recommended was bishop to f7. But again, I kind of need like fuller variations. I can't just uh, um, accept one move. Because for example, bishop to f7. Uh, first of all, I kind of need an, an answer for rook takes f7. But at the same time, there's also like king g7 or king h8, right? So um, I would be curious to see what the, what the follow-up is. Just wanted to be included. <laughs> Don't worry, you're always included. Um, yeah. So for example, let's say um, takes, obviously we're going to take, take, and then queen h7, right? And here the main question would be uh, what happens after king h8, right? Because we don't have enough time to take here because, oops, guess what? We get into a, we get into a smaller mate, right? And this is not good. So what do we do here? It's actually a very funny variation, in my opinion. Let me check on Wikipedia. Very Queen check on the e file. I'm guessing you mean queen e7, but again, like um, king goes here, right? Then move the knight to e file, like knight e4. Okay. Uh, I feel like there might still be some problems because we are in a position with. Um, like having a piece up, right? So let's see. Maybe there is this. I think it works. Rook here. And then if queen takes, then haha, we have this again. S because if knight takes, then rook takes, right? So that might be a problem. Again, we gotta keep the activity going, right? Yes, yeah, so there is one right suggestion, which is actually rook f1. And then the idea is that this king has to commit, right? Um, if the knight goes back to, to f6, then there's queen h8. Uh, you could even take on d7, actually, because if there is a pin, and the, the black king is completely in the open. Um, if king here, then there is queen g8, and most importantly, if knight f2, which is kind of the critical variation, king g1, but guess what? In this position, because of the pin, there is no discovery with the knight, so next move we can actually play rook takes f2, and then the position is completely winning for white. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of funny, right? Because there's like a double, there's like a double pin going on. But we actually get to capture on f2, and then like I said, the, the black king is completely open and it's not going to find shelter anytime soon. So we are completely winning here with the, with the white pieces, and on top of that we're going to be material up uh, after we take here on, on f2. Yeah, you saw this after bishop f7, I'm sure of it, I'm sure of it. Uh, just want to give a chance to, to the rest of the, of the chat, exactly. Um, yeah, okay, so that's what happens, yeah, that's what happens after, after rook takes, um, rook takes f7, right? 
but this move bishop f7 is very very crucial right because it completely blocks the connection that the rook has um, on the f file and since we know that capturing is not going to be an option for black then this gives us an extra turn, right? Because they have to make a move with the king, they have to waste the tempo. And in this particular position, time is of the essence, right? So bishop 2 f7, and then after this, the position went on kind of, kind of smoothly, right? But if we're being completely honest, I played uh, bishop takes g6 without actually seeing um, the idea of rook f1. Without actually seeing rook f1, knight f2, and then king g1. I just thought, okay, bishop takes g6 has to work because all of my pieces are involved in the in the game, right? So it has to work somehow. I thought that, you know, at least worst case scenario, I can have uh, some sort of like repetition in the in the board and then it's going to be completely fine. But actually after I played bishop g6 and my opponent was thinking, then I kept on calculating and then I realized that I had rook f1 and king g1. So that was very, very fortunate. But at the same time, if you remember last week when we talked about uh, Kasparov, how he played knight 2 h6, maybe you guys were here, maybe not. It was a good lecture. Uh, knight h6, then he said that he just assumed that it would be working because all of the pieces were involved. And then later, as Karpov was thinking, he kind of unraveled all of the variations. This is like that, but like, 10 notches down, okay? We're not, I'm not comparing myself to Kasparov, but uh, my variations here are a lot simpler. But it's kind of the same idea. A lot of times you, just, you can just start calculating your opponent's turn, and um, that way you also save some time. So actually, after bishop to f7, like I said, my opponent played king to h8, but after this, the position was very smooth. Now, uh, there are not as many threats, right? Like knight to f2 is not something that we need to worry about. The bishop on f7 is completely safe. Position is fine. We just have to uh, make sure that the, that the black pieces don't have any threats. And then we consolidate our position and continue with the attack, right? After this, the game is not that interesting. It actually continued uh, with h3, kicking the knight away. Knight to e3, and even though it seems like a problem because two of my pieces are attacked, the queen on c2 and the rook on f1, I actually have queen of two with a pin, and it helps the fact that all of the black pieces are very uncoordinated, right? Like the bishop on d7 has nothing to do with this knight. The two rooks, sure, I guess they are both um, coordinated, but they no, neither of them can come to the e-file, right? Uh, well, I guess you can play rook, rook e8, but that's what happened in the game, which I'm going to show in a second. Um, but yeah, and at the same time, the queen on d4 has no protector, so the knight is actually stuck, and overall the position is quite unpleasant for black, because there are even threats, you know, like of queen of six, if this queen ever moves, right? So, uh, just to quickly show, rook e8 was played, knight to d1, rook to e7, try to get some counter chances on the f file, but after knight takes e3, takes, takes, uh, we get to a position where not only do I have two rooks for a queen, which usually is winning material, but at the same time, I'm also a pawn up. Yeah, pawn up, right? So queen d2 was played, but then rook d1 takes takes. And eventually it took a little bit of, of conversion, but I managed to, to win my game, right? It went on for maybe, uh, it went on for longer than expected actually. It went on for like 20 more moves, but uh, this is actually just completely winning. So yeah, it all kind of has to do with, you know, deciding to commit to a move. In this case, bishop takes g6, and then making sure that, um, that it actually works, right? So it's not only having the confidence to commit to a move that completely changes the, the game, but at the same time, uh, I wouldn't say 20 moves of pure technique, but it was, pretty, it was pretty decent. Like my opponent didn't really have a chance after, but I don't know if pure technique, uh, but thanks. <laughs> but um, yeah, so not only does it have to do with like building up the confidence to commit to a sacrifice, right? Knowing that there's no way back, 
But at the same time, you have to keep a cool mind and actually calculate all of the defensive resources that the opponent has. In this case, knight to g4, which is kind of what I wanted to highlight. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I'm not seriously not comparing myself to Magnus here. I don't have anywhere uh, close to the technique. But, okay, so I feel like this was a decent example. Now, there's another one that I wanted to show, which is this one. And this one is a little bit different. Yeah, this one is a little bit different. Here we have a more, uh, we can say, like, calm position, like, more chill overall. And this is actually from a game of mine against um, international master Nazi Bakitsa in the 2022 US Championships. And I thought it was a very interesting game. I thought it was quite instructive too. Uh, because first of all, we're not going to be focusing on like direct sacrifices. This one's more of decision making, right? Uh, the, the game actually stemmed from a Queen's Indian and my opponent's last move was B6. Now, before anything, before we start talking about moves, I want to ask questions about what do you think, again, like how do you evaluate this position? What are some of the key aspects? What do you think white should do? Uh, what do you think black should do? What are either side lacking, right? Because there is uh, there's some imbalance in the position, but I hope you explain it to me and then I'll explain it to you, so yeah. Bishops and pawns. Um, more accurate words have never been said. So, exactly. Space. Very true. I agree. No, you're not getting the little white arrows anymore. It, you know, they have been disqualified. So, just look at the bishops. They want it. Let them, <laughs> let them cook it. Well, the question is like, what are they cooking, right? Like, you know, what, what cuisine do they want to cook today? Because it can go one way, it can go another way, it can get very dynamic, it can be very chill, like, you know. It can be spicy, it can be like, you know, uh, what is it, like long cooked meal. Like, there, there's a lot going on. So, I just have some questions. I feel like the, the basics of this position is quite easy to understand. The fact that I, with the white pieces, have a lot of space, and then my opponent's uh, development is a little bit more restricted, but at the same time, black has a target, right? Which is my center. Like, I have to be really careful of what I do with my center, um, because, there can be a lot of threats against it, but at the same time, I can use my center to build up uh, momentum behind it, right? That's kind of like a barrier and a shield. And then uh, behind the, the pawn chain, I can m regroup all of my pieces so that I can have a breakthrough, right? And at the same time, my advantage lies with space, which means that it has to do with dynamics, and um, kind of like reacting quickly in a position. Meanwhile, for black, they want to trade a few pieces, get a little bit more space, and then attack my pawn structure, right? So for me, it's more beneficial to keep pieces on the board and to um, get the initiative. So based off of that, what would you do in this position here? Just like as a general question. Ah, this wasn't the four pawns. It was a, um, it was a, a Queen's Indian. Like the bishop before check, knight t two, castles a three, um, bishop back, and e four variation. But yeah, welcome to the stream, Nisa. How's it going? Okay, so we're we we're going strong with e five. Any other suggestions? Also, like, I want you to think deeper than one move. So you gotta give me, like, a variation at least. That's, 
essentially everything we learned about from the previous example. So. We also have, we had e5, now we also have knight d5, and then if knight takes, c takes, and then this bishop will be useless, and then this pawn will be backwards. That is true, knight d5 is a move to consider. I will go for e5 as a blitz move, and then just see what happens. Yeah, so that's kind of calling into your intuition, right? Like e5, have some sort of breakthrough in the position, I'm also wondering, like, two people have suggested e5, but, like, you need to explain to me what happens after takes, six, knight takes. Because I have questions. And they need to be answered. <laughs> um, so, yeah. After regrouping pieces, maybe c5 at the right moment. Interesting. There's also knight f3 and knight d4, which uh, I wish I could do that, but my pawn on e4 is a little bit compromised. So after knight f3, maybe there's going to be like knight e4 or something. So keep that in mind. Any other last suggestions before we actually move on? I like how you guys think about e5, but not c5. I'm going to ask you, what do you think about c5 here? Because I feel like it's a slightly better version of e5. So. Okay, so there's one comment for c5. Any ideas? Like, is it, is it a good move? Is it a bad move? Obviously, it's wanting to open up the diagonal. Um, that the queen has and put some pressure here on f7, right? Maybe the bishop can come here too. And it seems like less committal than e5 because e5 is also opening up the center and we don't necessarily want to, to open up this file because the knight on e3 is our worst piece, right? It's kind of misplaced there. If the knight was on f3, it's a completely different position. But unfortunately, my knight is on e3. So, yeah. So what do you think about c5? And again, like imagine this is your game, right? So you don't know if this is the right moment to break through or if you're just, you know, going down the path of the game where you're going to be worse for the, for the rest of the game and then you have to, to, um, to hold because you had one pretty idea but it didn't work, right? So like you really have to, to balance it out and it requires a lot of thinking, a lot of committal and that's kind of where your intuition comes in, right? Because it tells you, hey, this is a good idea, or hey, this is a bad idea. So, you guys can just comment C5 in the chat because I said, what do you think about C5? So I'm asking more like, what do you think of, of the move, right? Like, do you think it has some potential? Um, or is, does it not? C5 looks like a Hans kind of move. Well, uh, if I tell you <laughs> that I played c5, what would you say? <laughs> so, yeah. c5. What do you guys think? c5, a4, you kind of have to calculate, right? Like c5, a4. Probably the queen will go to a2 to keep the threats here, but yeah. I won't say anything, but not sure about Kramnik. I think Kramnik will be fine with my decision. Maximum peace activation. Okay, so from what I can understand, you guys can correct me, but from what I can understand is that most of you, once I mentioned c5, realize that it's a very interesting move, right? And I feel like it does have some merit because after c5, we're going to bring the bishop to c4. 
black has to do something about f7, and then the idea of e5 is still at large, right? And if we kick this knight away from f6, then the knight can come to d5, maybe the bishop can also come to d5. There are just a lot of ideas, right? After c5, there are so many lines. Well, this is what we calculate. So, yeah. Um, so, okay, c5. Like I said, it's the move that I played in the game. But guess what? c5 is actually incorrect. It's not a good move. It's not horrible. It's like um, maybe a tiny advantage for black, but white still has a lot of play. The funny thing is that it's actually difficult to believe that this move works when my pieces are not at their best, right? Like this rook on a1 is not really doing anything. The knight on e3, it's on a, at a very awkward spot, right? So it's unclear whether things are going to work or not. And again, I have no pressure to break through the position at this point because black has very limited space. So there's no need for me to completely shift the position right now because black is already limited, right? I'm not limiting with c5. In fact, I'm giving a few extra options to black, right? And the very funny thing is that back when I played this game, I think the day, the night of it was the rest day. Sorry, the night before the rest day, right? Like next day we had rest day, so that, so that night I was hanging out with some friends. I was talking with the grandmaster. We were talking about this game because it was actually a very interesting game, like after this move. C5 might not have been the most accurate, but it led to very interesting positions. And um, we're talking about this specific position, and then I asked my friend, a grandmaster, what would you do here? And he said, well, of course, I would play rook e1. So simple. Makes a lot of sense. And I was like, but didn't, you didn't even consider c5? And he was like, no, why would I? It looks bad. <laughs> it looks bad because the pieces are not ready. It's so obvious. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was um, a little bit of a learning moment for me. And it does, make, it does make a lot of sense, right? Because why would I, practically speaking, right? Like, why would I spend so much time to force, basically force C5 to work in my mind so that I can, you know, have an interesting position? But I don't know what's going on. Like, why would I spend so much time and energy to force a variation to work that doesn't originally look like it's working, right? Because c5 is kind of an ugly move, if you think about it, since there are so many things that need to, to, to be taken into consideration. Uh, there's just a lot going on. It's a move that's a little too intense for the position right now. Why would I even, um, why would I even think about this, right? Um, so logically, actually, a lot of times as a move is, if, if a move is ugly, the general consensus is that it's not good. So just keep that in mind. Rook a1, on the other hand, makes so much more sense uh, because it's improving the position. It's bringing the rook over to the e file. It's going to put some, some reinforcement on e4, right, uh, which is weak. And then at the same time, I'm building up the idea to go knight d5. Uh, my rook is much better off in the center. Um, and, you know, in general, I'm just going to slowly but surely improve the position because what I need to do here is to keep the tension and then try to slowly suffocate my opponent because they just don't have enough space, right? So um, that would have been a much better idea. And then, for example, let's say after bishop to b7, uh, we can obviously just play knight d5, and the position is completely fine. I would personally say that after take six, um, c5, b5, the position is easier to play as easier to play as white. It's just a lot more comfortable, I would say, uh, because of all of the you know all of the space that that we have. But funny enough, even if we play a move like bishop to c3 just to reinforce the position. It's actually very interesting because even if you let, um, even if you let uh, black capture this pawn after rook takes, whoops, rook takes knight d5, 
Black has no moves, right? Like, they manage to get the pawn on e4, but opening files only works for white in this case because uh, literally black has no moves, no space, no coordination. So taking on e4 would have been a really big mistake, in fact. And now c7 is in trouble. The e4 rook is in trouble. If you give me the e file, I will break through. Uh, there is some tension between these two bishops and then the dark squares around the king are going to be weak. So actually the position is like clearly better if rook takes takes. Uh, there is just like too much uh, going on, right? And then most likely black will have to give up this c7 pawn. So actually that would have been a lot, a lot better, just rook a1. It would have saved me a lot of time, a lot of energy and it would have kept my position slightly better. However, like I said, I played c5. I still stand by the original essence of this move, you know, like try to make the position interesting, but maybe I would play c5 in a blitz game where I'm not risking anything, but this is a big, very important classical game, right? So um, in a classical game, for sure, I would, I would um, reconsider c5. A4 is actually probably the strongest variation because the whole point is that, um, let's say if like takes, uh, if takes and there's bishop c4, queen a7, and then here I wanted to play knight d5, takes, takes, uh, rook b8, and then this was my point, right? That at the end I have queen c3, and then I can take the pawn. So this is what I wanted to do, but um, it's, uh, it's not so easy because of a4 first, and then actually after queen a2, after queen a2 takes, bishop c4, rook e7, e7 was played, queen e7 was another option, um, queen e7 was another option, but even here, the position is just very complicated, um, and the rest of the game is not that important, like I said, there were a lot of ups and downs, we quickly reached time trouble, because uh, there's just like way too much to calculate in the position, there were a lot of ups and downs. I was actually winning in the end game, but I couldn't find a way to, somehow just like at the board, I couldn't find a way to break through. And we ended up repeating and making a draw. So um, it was overall just a very interesting game. I just thought that this was a very critical moment because um, yeah, the game was actually very interesting after that, but it doesn't really pertain to our topic today. Um, but what I wanted to talk about was like this specific moment because it's a very normal position. It's a position that any of you watching could easily have uh, in your own games. And it's not as much about remembering this specific position and trying to play exactly as I should have done in your own games, but more of like capturing the idea, right? That before you do any form of breakthrough, you really have to have all of your pieces involved. Uh, you have to make sure there are no weak links, right? Um, and overall just understand um, when your position is ready and when it's not, right? So if you can keep on improving your position before having that breakthrough because it's really not going anywhere, then just improve all of your pieces before that. Um, and that's what I should have done here, but unfortunately I didn't. But it works as a, as a learning experience. So, if there are no more questions about this particular example, then we can kind of already uh, jump onto the last one that I had planned for, for today, uh, which I think is also very interesting. And it brings me a lot of fun memories, actually. If it loads. Okay, perfect. Um, so, this is a game from the last round of Serbia Open, which I played over the, the summer last year. I had a lot of fun in that tournament. I went through this like um, European, um, how should I say, like tournament tour. Um, I had a lot of fun in all of my events. Serbia Open was a really fun tournament to play. Hopefully I can, I can go back again this year. Um, and this is the last, last round game. I can't remember exactly what I was doing, but I do remember that this game was at like, 9 or 10 a.m. and I went to sleep at like 2 or 3. So again, I don't remember what I was doing. I also, I also got sick in that tournament, maybe that had to do with it, but I was like 
Jesus Christ, what am I going to play tomorrow? I haven't even prepped and I need to sleep. Um, so I ended up playing uh, this very funky variation in the Sicilian. Um, it kind of transposed just to like a regular Nidorf. And then there were a lot of um, breakthroughs in the center. I was letting my opponent capture some of the queenside pawns to um, open up some files so that I can attack. And we find ourselves in this very peculiar position, right? Because my opponent also uh, gave up some material. If you just, you know, do the first step of um, evaluating a position, which is material and counting, you would realize that I have an extra bishop. I have my pair of bishops, which if anyone watches any of my content, you know that I'm very excited about um, having the pair of bishops whenever the opportunity arises. And in this particular case, I do have an extra bishop, but unfortunately I am two pawns down, right? Uh, my king is very, <laughs> very open on d7, but I wouldn't say that the white king is necessarily super safe either, right? Because it's a Sicilian, anything can happen. Um, so we have encountered this position. There are a lot of threats going on. Uh, one of them being rook takes e7. I am sure that when my opponent, there were a lot of complications before getting to this point. Um, there were a lot of forcing moves and I'm sure that my opponent just didn't take into account the, the move that I played in this position. Um, and he thought that he would be fine with initiative, but um, it all kind of has to do not just with uh, not just with evaluation and trying to understand the subtleties of the position, but also a lot of calculation, right? And kind of like a little bit of that killer instinct, which is important if you're playing sharp openings. So what do you think I did here with the black pieces? Again, committing to a move, right? Like if we're gonna go for it, we're gonna go for it and it's gonna work. Wasn't this Morpheus innovation preparing tactics by focusing on development? I don't know if he was the first one to think about this, but for sure he was a very big innovator. I always love going back to like those watching games from like 1800s or like early 1900s, uh, especially before Steinitz, there was like this romantic style of chess, which is very exciting because it often has to do with material versus time, right? Or like material versus development. and. A lot of times one side gives up a lot of materials so that they can develop a few pieces and then because the opponent was so busy capturing pieces then they're able to checkmate the king, right? Which is very, very fun, right? It's very beautiful. Nowadays it doesn't work as easily because defense has improved a lot. Um, but it's always fun to, to see. So we have two suggestions for rook b2 and we have one for queen g7. But again, I need to see full variations because if you're telling me that you want to play rook g2, obviously white is going to capture back, right? So I need a little bit more context. I'm not just going to be like, oh, great job, rook b2. Um, and end it there. Because if you're, when you're playing a real game, like you, you're not just like, oh, rook b2. And then the move, next move you're like, Okay, let's figure it out now. Like you figure it all out before it happens, right? So. Okay, so I like what I'm seeing. Rook b2, king takes b2, rook b8. Uh, then there is an idea of rook a8, right? So if the king goes to, to the a file. That is true because then the white queen gets pinned, right? And the last move from that queen was queen takes a6, so you could think that this was all calculated. Um, but, so rook b2, king takes rook b1, there is knight b5, right? Knight b5, we can't really afford to take with the bishop because there are too many threats, like for example, rook takes e7, um, or even queen e7, uh, queen a7. So um, after knight to b5, we have to take with the rook, and then the king can either go to c3, to a2, and it's really important to, to take all of those moves into consideration and the material as well into consideration. Because after knight to b5, rook takes, then we have two bishops for 
uh, two bishops for a rook, which is still more than enough material, considering that the that the black king that the white king is out in the open. I did say that two rooks for a queen is a more favorable trade, but you also have to understand the subtleties of the position. So yes, rook takes b2 is a move that I decided to play. It's actually um, a very obvious in intuitive idea, but you really have to make sure that it works so you commit to it, right? And the point is that after it takes rook b8, the king, uh, if it moves, it has to go to the a file, let's say like king a1. And yes, I did say that two rooks are better than a queen, but you gotta pay attention to this position because it's not two rooks, it's two rooks and a bishop, right? And not only that, it's uh, a queen and a pair of bishops, literally the most deadly combination that you could have, and the white king is very open, right? So there are ideas of bishop f6, which are not going to be easy to face, the pawn on h4 is hanging, the queen can go like queen h4, queen b4, something like that. How are these two rooks going to do anything? Right, so it's not it, it it's not just like two rooks versus a queen. There are a lot more elements taken into account. In general, the two rooks work better if they coordinate, uh, but if the if the king is wide open, then the queen can be very dangerous, right? And in this case, it's not just a queen. Like I said, also a pair of bishops. Um, so this is completely winning for 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 black. There is no. Um, there's no way around it. So, if instead of king a1, then knight to b5, which is a move that we need to consider, then, uh, like I said, we don't really have time for bishop b5 because there's queen a7 and there are just way too many, uh, too many elements going on in this position. But we do something else, right? Where's the winning continuation? Like rook b5, let's say king a2. How does, how does black ensure the win? I believe there's more than one way to win, but I, I'm confident that I found the quickest, so. Again, it may look a little scary because the, the king is in the center and there are always the ideas of rook e7, but at the same time, um, we have enough time, right? Like the, the white king is in even worse shape. So what to do? Rook b8, threatening rook a8. Maybe, but you also, again, like have to consider th the fact that it might be a little slow. Like for example, rook b8 maybe takes, takes, and then takes, and then if queen in here, c4. Oh, wait, no, there is check here. Oh my god, I almost missed that. Well. Wow. So intelligent. Um, maybe just rook d5. Probably it's still good, but um, I would say that white has a lot more chances than before, so. Queen h5 probably works, but the, the move that I decided to play was actually queen g7. And I think this move is really good because there's not much that, that, um, that white can do here. And it all kind of has to do a little bit with the, with the geometry of the board, which I find to be quite beautiful. Uh, queen g7 not only 
not only does it create a threat, right, with queen b2, but at the same time, it keeps an eye on the bishop on e7, right? So if rook takes, queen takes, there's never going to be anything. Um, if queen a7, then there's going to be rook b7, which is actually what happened in the game I'm going to show later. Uh, if rook b1 trying to, to protect from the checkmate, then there's bishop d5. And, you know, if king a3, then queen c3. So it's completely winning. Um, actually, if king a4, I'm just going to show the variation. There is queen c4 and queen a2. So that's quite nice. And just to briefly show um, what happened in the game. Actually, before that, I'm going to show you what happens if queen a3, which is also quite nice. There is queen to g8, king a1, and then bishop to f6. And then after, um, after c3, uh, we have the really beautiful bishop takes takes. And because the queen is giving a check on g8 and not on f7, we actually have queen a8. So we have the kind of like a ladder checkmate, and there's no way to, to recover from it. So the two bishops are pretty strong with the queen covering and then there's going to be a, a checkmate on a8. And then what happened in the game is not too different from that. Uh, queen a7 happened, rook b7, queen d4, but here there is just queen g8, right? And then queen a8. So yeah, it's funny that the queen was on h6 not doing much, then it went to g7 and then it had like this um, very nice idea. So. Based on three on these three different examples, the first one kind of had to do with committing to a sacrifice and then making sure that uh, you can take into account and properly calculate the defenses that the opponents can can have. Um, the second one revolved around deciding whether or not to have a breakthrough in the position. In the particular case, it was better to keep improving the pieces before actually breaking through with c5. Uh, it wasn't necessarily horrible, but it was just uh, an inaccurate move, right? Like there's no need to, like I said, there's no need to spend so much time and energy and, um, you know, like kind of wasting yourself trying to force a move to work when you can just like slowly improve your position and then you're not going to, um, you're not going to lose that breakthrough idea until next turn, right? Uh, and then this final example is when the position is very sharp. Uh, maybe you can sense that you're a little bit better already, kind of combined, um, committing to a move to also like the killer instinct and like breaking through the, the opponent's castled king with rook b2. So yeah, those were the three examples that I wanted to, to show today. I hope you guys um, enjoyed. And I think with that, we're going to be ending the stream, right? Oh yes, whenever you'd like. All right. Peace out, everyone. Bye-bye.